Hey, good evening, everyone. We're so thankful that you could join us here tonight at online at First Christian Church for our Good Friday service. Good Friday is one of the most special days of the entire yearly calendar for us as followers of Jesus Christ because on this day we reflect upon and we remember his great sacrifice for us. And that really is the foundation of our faith, that God so loved this world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God made him who had no sin become sin for us so that we might become his righteousness. And that's what Good Friday represents. God's great love for us, shown through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Thankfully, we know that this is not the end of the story. The story uh, goes on through Resurrection Sunday when Jesus emerges victorious from the tomb. But on tonight, it's important that we remember how great God's love and how amazing his grace is that he's willing to sacrifice everything so that you and I could be set free. There's a couple of things we want you to keep in mind tonight. Uh, we sent an email out earlier this week for how you could prepare for tonight's service. Uh, there's a few items we told you to go around the house and try to find to use as object lessons, so especially if you've got young kids at home. It might help create some memories to help these truths really sink in. Uh, so there are three items we told you to try to collect around your home that symbolize or represent different themes. Uh, the first item was to find something that represents the worst chore, the, the worst job that anybody around your house has to do on a somewhat regular basis. Uh, depending upon who you ask in your home, you may get a, a difference of opinion about that. So if you have more than one item, that's certainly fine. Uh, the second item we asked you to find was something that represents team or teamwork or unity, things, something about uh, coming together. And uh, so uh, that was the second item. The third item was something that measures. Uh, there are a variety of different instruments that are used to take different kinds of measurement. And so, again, kind of open to your interpretation, but uh, something that measures. So something that represents the worst job in your home, the chore that nobody wants to do, something that represents team or unity, and then something that uh, represents measurement. The other thing we want to make sure you're prepared for is that as a part of our worship service tonight, we will be celebrating communion. Uh, we've been doing this, uh, again, virtually for a few weeks now, so hopefully during that time you've been able to find something uh, in your pantry at home that could represent the bread and the wine so that you can participate with us and together as one body we can celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper. Lastly, before we begin tonight, my mind is thinking, as I'm sure yours is, about all that we're facing in our world right now and how our world, our, our country, our culture, everything about life has been changed by this virus. And we have uh, medical uh, professionals and scientists and researchers who are working around the clock trying to find a cure or, or treatments that might work, develop a vaccine that we can take to try to keep this from happening again. And it got me to think about this idea of finding a cure and, and finding a treatment. And that's what Good Friday represents. Good Friday represents when Jesus came to be our cure, to be our treatment. Because you and I have a sin problem that we'll never be able to take care of on our own. Jesus is the only remedy. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that will bring healing to us. And that's what we celebrate tonight, that Jesus came to set us free, to bring us healing, to reconcile us back to God. So we're so thankful that you're here tonight with us. Will you join me in the word of prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your great love for us, your amazing grace that was showered upon us from your cross. Lord, we're thankful that the story didn't end with your death, that you emerged victorious over sin and death once and for all when you came out of that tomb. But tonight, Lord, tonight we focus on that sacrifice, what it cost you, and also, Lord, the example that you set for us in giving of your life and giving of everything you had to demonstrate what true love is all about. Lord Jesus, we just pray that everything we do and say tonight would honor you, would bring glory to your name. Thank you so much, Jesus, for all that you've done for us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good Friday was a brutal day by any standard. It was on this day that our Savior was killed. But killed is even too simple a word. He was whipped and beaten spit on by strangers, a crown of thorns forced onto his head, his hands and feet nailed to a cross, mocked by an audience who despised him, abandoned by everyone he knew, and forsaken by God himself. It was a day that the earth trembled, 
and the sun refused to shed its light on the death of the one who created it. But it was all this pain, all this torment, and the very act of being forsaken that makes Good Friday so good. Because the pain that was endured, the mocking that was undeserved, and the abandonment that was experienced all led to our Savior's final dying words on the cross. Words whose weight have no equal in history. With these words, our sins no longer hold us. With these words, our records, crimson with pride and lust, hatred and jealousy, fear and timidity, have been washed as white as snow. With these words, our debt has been paid. It is finished. No amount of sorrow can replace the price that was paid for these words to be spoken, that all who believe in the one who spoke them are redeemed. And that is why we celebrate, because on this day our punishment was endured by another. On this day our debt was paid. On this Friday, this good Friday. For the last several weeks, we've been learning more about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Uh, following Jesus uh, as his disciple is what we've been calling the journey worth taking. Now, when we think about what Jesus did for us on what we call Good Friday, we're reminded that Jesus has given us everything that we need or our provisions for this journey. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he tried to prepare his first disciples for what this new road would look like and how in him they had everything that they needed. They'd been given everything they needed to walk this journey with success. Now that night was the final feast of Passover, and Jesus and his disciples were celebrating that most special of holy days to the Jews in the upper room. Now Passover for the Jews was a sacred tradition that dated back to their time in captivity as slaves in Egypt, and it celebrated God's deliverance of his people uh, in their journey to freedom. It also pointed ahead to the time when God would send his own spotless lamb to atone for the sins of all mankind. Now, everything about the Passover was very, very scripted. It was the same food, uh, the same scriptures read, the same songs that were sung. So when Jesus changed the script that night, it caught his disciples' attention, and it caused them some alarm. Jesus was trying to prepare them for the next part of the journey, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and ultimately his departure back to heaven and the beginnings of his church. Yet he could see the concern and confusion in his disciples' eyes. So in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, Jesus shared with them this amazing promise and definitive claim about his true identity. He said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the place to where I'm going. Uh, Thomas, one of his disciples, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. On our journey with Jesus, we've been saying for several weeks now that he is our destination. He has gone, as it says here in the scriptures, he's gone to prepare a place for us uh, for all eternity in heaven. But he's also our guide. He states with certainty, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, those three realities of Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, those are the provisions that we take with us on our journey with him. And tonight, we're going to focus on each one as a reminder of how he fulfilled all of those names and titles upon the cross, and how he has uh, led us to follow in that example. Now, we asked uh, you to come up with some items at home that represent uh, what would be considered to be the worst job or worst chore that has to be performed on a somewhat regular basis. So I wonder what you came up with. Maybe you got them there in, in the living room with you while you're watching this. Well, for me, uh, the object that symbolized the worst job in our home was this, a, a plunger. Now, you know that when you use this particular tool at your house, well, it's not going to be pretty. I mean, you are humbling yourself to deal with something unclean and unsanitary, and 
that you might not even be responsible for. I mean, it's got to be one of the dirtiest and certainly the least glorifying jobs to perform. When Jesus wanted his disciples to understand what he meant when he referred to himself as the way, he too performed a humble, lowly task, an act of service to make his point. Early on that night at the Last Supper, uh, the disciples had come in uh, arguing over who was going to be the greatest among them. It most likely started out as an argument over the seating arrangement at supper that night. Uh, The positions of honor to Jesus' right and to his left uh, might have been interpreted by the disciples as the positions of glory in his new kingdom. Uh, The disciples, once again, had missed the nature of the kind of kingdom that Jesus had come to establish. So in order to make it clear to disciples and to leave no doubt, Jesus showed them uh, the way that he expected them to live. The scripture tells us that he got it from the table. He took off his outer garment. He tied a towel around his waist. And one by one, he washed the feet of all 12 of his disciples. That's right. All 12 of his disciples, including Judas, who in just a few hours would sell him out to those conspiring against Jesus simply for the price of a common slave. Now, when Jesus finished washing his disciples' feet, he returned to the table to his seat as the host. And he said, Do you understand what I've done for you? Uh, You call me your Lord and your master, and you should, for that's who I am. But if I, your Lord and your master, have done this for you, would humble myself to serve in this manner, don't you think you should do the same? See, this is what Jesus means by the way. Jesus coming to earth and sacrificing himself for us on the cross, it brings us salvation, but it also creates a pattern, a model, a, a way of doing life. It's the manner in which we are to walk on our journey with him because it's living by loving. It's walking in his way. Uh, Jesus concluded that moment uh, of the dinner by saying this in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He said, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will everyone know that you are my disciple if you love one another. Jesus is the way. He has provided the blueprint for the one way that we are to live, by walking in his love.
His body the bread, his blood the wine, broken and poured out, all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing. What beautiful words and, and powerful images of the truth about who Jesus is and what he accomplished for us on the cross. Uh, so for that's the second of the provisions that Jesus gives us for our journey with him, that Jesus is the truth. Now, what truth exactly, what truths or realities of life does the person of Jesus give evidence to? Well, first, it gives evidence about the truth concerning God. God is holy. God cannot abide sin. In him, there, there is no darkness. And yet sin has come into and tainted this world that he created. The coming of Jesus gives evidence of God's intended purpose to reclaim his glory in his world. But the person of Jesus also gives evidence about us. We are sinners. Now, God loves us, and he made us in his image for a relationship with him. But because of our choices, our sin, we became objects of God's wrath. We had separated ourselves from God, and there was no possibility, no hope of that chasm being crossed through our own good effort or through our own works. That reality points to the need for Jesus. Jesus is the only way to be reconciled to God. His cross is the bridge. His death and resurrection are what reunites us with God. It's what connects us with each other in this beautiful uh, fellowship that we call His church. We are the body of Christ because we were brought back to God through the body of Christ. Now, the second item you were encouraged to find at home was something that represents uh, team or teamwork or, or unity. Uh, maybe you found something that, uh, that symbolizes or represents one of your uh, favorite sports teams. You know, we can't watch our teams right now, but uh, maybe many of us value the chance that one day, hopefully sooner or later, we'll get to cheer them on to victory. Uh, or maybe you found, as you went around your house, you found a, a symbol of victory, like a trophy like this, that uh, it's a sign of the rewards that can be found when a team unites around a common vision or a common goal. Uh, in many sports, when a team wins a championship, uh, they'll, they'll lift a cup. And that cup becomes the sign and seal of victory brought about by sacrifice and community. Well, that Passover meal that we mentioned earlier, Jesus instituted a new celebration that also involved a cup. And that cup symbolized sacrifice. And Jesus lifted that cup among his team and prepared them for a victory that would soon be theirs and ours through him. In Matthew chapter 26, we read about it. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know, the word uh, in the original Greek New Testament for this new celebration meal that Jesus instituted is eucharizo or Eucharist. Uh, the word means thanksgiving. Uh, see, the original thanksgiving didn't in really involve Native Americans or pilgrims or even a turkey. Uh, it was on that night, almost 2,000 years ago, when Jesus showed us the truth, that he is the only way to be reunited with God's team, the only way to be reconciled back to the Father. Now, each time we come together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we too are giving a thanksgiving for his sacrifice. When we have Thanksgiving meals with our actual family, we, we look back and we reminisce uh, to memories of our families and those who might no longer be with us and, and cherishing those moments. But we also look forward to the moments when our families get to be reunited uh, each and every year and how our families might be growing with, with new additions. As we celebrate our Thanksgiving meal with Jesus, we also remember what has happened before us, that he went to the cross before us. We think about all the saints who have come before us. But we also remember that one day in the future, he will join us again at the new table, when he returns and calls us back home. That too is the truth that Jesus brings. So tonight, even though we might not be able to gather in person, we still gather as one family, the body of Christ, to remember his sacrifice that won our victory. This bread, this bread represents the body of Christ that he laid down willingly so that we could be set free from our sins 
and have the hope of eternal life. Let's take this in remembrance of him. This fruit of the vine represents the blood of Christ that he pours out upon us to cleanse us from our sin so that we might live for him with thanksgiving. Let's drink this in remembrance of him. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds, by His wounds we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds, by His wounds, we are healed We are healed by your sacrifice And the life that you gave We are healed for you paid the price And by your grace we are saved We are saved For our transgressions, crushed for our sins, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, by his wounds, we are By your grace we are saved, we are saved. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. By His wounds, by His wounds we are healed. By his wounds, by his wounds, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, when I think about the new life that Jesus has in mind for us, I'm reminded of the moment when Moses was preparing the Israelites for their new lives in the promised land. God had used Moses to lead Israel out of slavery and had sealed his promise through the blood of the Passover lamb. And God had prepared a faithful generation uh, to inhabit this new land in the, uh, during the period of their wilderness wandering. Now through Moses, God wanted his people to understand how this new life that he had saved them for was meant to be lived. So I want you to listen to Moses' words to the people of Israel from Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, verses 15 through 20. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will be able to live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away and bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. 
Now, choose life. Choose life so that you and your children would live and that you would love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord, for the Lord is your life. Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the life. God wor- God's word makes it clear to us that on the journey of life, there's really only two paths that you can travel, only two paths that you can choose from. Uh, Moses called Israel to choose life. Now life is only found within God's best for us. But what the Bible also makes it clear is that we've all fallen short of that perfection. None of us is righteous. No no one has walked that road without departing from it. That is why Jesus has come, and that is why he's died. Through his death, we too can have life again. And just as Jesus won us a new life through his death, he tells us that if we want to find that life, then we too must die to that old self. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life, cling to it, well, they're going to lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good would it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? The last item you were supposed to find was some tool or instrument that's used for measurement. Now, I'm sure those were probably in abundance into your house because there's all different kinds of tools that we use to measure different things in different quantities. Uh, you might have found a tape measure used for measuring distances and length. Uh, or maybe you went to the kitchen and you found something like this, a measuring cup that's used for measuring volume and trying to get the right amount into your recipe. Or maybe you found something similar to this, a, a scale of some kind or a balance used for measuring uh, weight or determining mass. Now, a scale, I think, really helps us to understand the true meaning of the cross. Uh, A set of scales like this uh, even reminds us of the shape of the cross, at least when it's in balance. You see, when it comes to us and God, everything was out of balance because our sin made it impossible for us to be in a relationship with him. But Jesus came and he he brought balance. He absorbed him to himself, himself being the pure, spotless, uh, sinless son of God, all of our sin. And by doing so, he imputed upon us God's holiness and his righteousness. Now, God has done everything necessary to rid us of our disease, our our sin problem, to make us whole, to bring us healing. But the one thing that we can only do for ourselves is to choose to receive that offer of grace. We too have the same exact choice before us that Israel was given. That choice we make about Jesus will determine not only our eternal destiny, but affect all the other choices that we make here in this life we have on earth. Are we going to choose life? Or are we going to choose death? You know, as Jesus hung on that cross that day, he was positioned between two men, two criminals, who were being executed for crimes that they actually committed. Initially, both criminals were just as hostile to Jesus as the crowds who were shouting out, crucify him, crucify him were. Uh, but something changed. Something changed that day for one of the criminals. He made a different choice. Now, let me show you what made all the difference. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they were doing. Did you catch it? Both criminals were being cruel and hostile towards Jesus, but in that moment, one of the criminals was blown away by the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus. Just a few verses later, the other criminal who hung there hurling insults at him. He says, hey, aren't you the Messiah? Aren't you the Christ? Why don't you save yourself and save us while you're at it? But the other criminal, the other criminal has been changed. He's, he's made a different choice. The other criminal rebuked him and said, don't you fear God since you were and I under the same sentence. We're being punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That criminal made a choice to place his faith in Jesus and his scale was brought into balance because of the cross of Christ. Jesus has done it. It is finished. All there is for you to do is to respond. Receive Jesus' love and grace. He is the way. 
Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the life. It's true life. It's, it's real life. The life you and I were always meant to live. And it can be yours when you choose to follow him. never been a time when God wasn't working on our behalf. He was working through a woman, 
when she poured a jar of expensive perfume on Jesus' head. He was working at a dinner when Jesus and his disciples shared the Last Supper. He was working during an agonizing prayer when Jesus pleaded in the Garden of Gethsemane while his disciples slept. He was working through a traitor's kiss when Judas betrayed him and armed men arrested Jesus. He was working through the chief priests when they tried him, spit in his face, and struck Jesus with their fists. He was working through a weak disciple when Peter called down curses upon himself and denied even knowing Jesus. He was working through a governor when Pilate released a notorious prisoner and brutally flogged Jesus until he was bloody. He was working through a manipulated crowd when they shouted all the louder, crucify him. He was working through mocking soldiers when they twisted a crown of thorns onto Jesus' head and led him to a place called Golgotha. He was working through the wood and steel when they drove nails into his hands and crucified the King of Kings on the cross. He was working through the Son of Man when he cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was working through the shedding of blood as it drained from Jesus' lifeless body. He was working through a rich man when he took Jesus' body, wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and laid him to rest in the tomb. He was working in the sudden silence, in the abandonment by his heavenly Father, in the confusion and fear of the disciples, and then he was working through a stone that was rolled away, a tomb that was empty, an angel that said, He is not here. He has risen. And so the Father was working through the resurrection power that brought Jesus back to life. And to this very day, He is working on our behalf through the trials, temptations, and tests, making the impossible possible, bringing life to the lifeless and power to the powerless through the miraculous love of the Father and His risen Son. For Jesus is risen and forever alive. Hey, we want to thank you once again for joining us tonight for our Good Friday service. I hope that this reflection upon Jesus' uh, sacrifice for you has been a blessing to you and your family. And it's just reminded you again of just how great God's love for you is and how amazing His grace is. Uh, we want to invite you back again this coming Sunday at 11 o'clock to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, His victory over sin and death once and for all, for you, for me, and for all those who have put their trust in Him. We'd love to have you back again. We hope everyone is staying safe out there. We want you to know that we love you, and your church family is here for you if you have any kind of need. I'm going to close this with a word of prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, once again, we, our words fall short to express our gratitude uh, for the incredible gift that you made for us by your body, your blood, being given to pay the penalty for our sin. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we can have in knowing that truth and that reality and receiving it into our lives. Uh, Lord, we just continue to ask your provision uh, to be upon uh, everyone across this world that is in this battle right now. We just pray for their protection and safety and strength. Uh, Lord, help all of us to find whatever way we can to be a part of the solution, to be about showing your love and your grace and your mercy and your kindness to everyone that you put into our path. Uh, Lord, we pray for healing in whatever form that needs to take, wherever it needs to happen, because we know that you, you alone, Lord, are the answer to what we most desperately need. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice, and we look forward to Sunday and every day to celebrate your resurrection and your resurrection power that can come to be at work in us. Lord, we love you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. God bless you guys.